each one of you. And just to say thank you so much for choosing to join us um, in this webinar series. And uh, just for introduction for the sake of those who do not know me. So my name is Martina Lembani. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Public Health at UWC. I joined the school in 2014 as a postdoctoral researcher and uh, specifically working in the area of uh, health systems research and policy. And since then, I've been working uh, within the cluster of uh, uh, health policy and systems uh, research within the school. And I'm co-hosting this uh, webinar series with my colleague, uh, Gina Teddy. She will introduce herself later when she starts with a presentation. So um, I will let her introduce herself in more details, but she is a colleague we did together, the postdoc, uh, when she was based at UCT, I was at UWC. And uh, just a bit more of a background to this whole webinar series that we have introduced. Um, usually the School of Public Health has a history of uh, what we call winter schools, where in the month of July, we would have these one week long uh, sessions for different courses running. But since COVID-19 uh, last year, we are not able to host those um, winter schools. So this year we have now decided to come up with um, a way of still providing those courses, but through webinar series. And uh, this is one of such, and it's the first time ever that we are providing this type of um, course. And therefore we're hoping that uh, when we go through this, at the end of the session, we'll be able to get some feedback in terms of how did you find it? Is it something that people would want us to keep on offering uh, going into the future? Or maybe then we'll get some suggestions in terms of how we can actually modify it to make it uh, more comprehensive and meet the people's needs. And I'm sure when you were doing your registration, you were taken to the website where there was uh, details about this webinar and what the papers is, which is basically to um, empower our health practitioners, those that are in the field or at working at managerial level, it could be the, in the at the national department level, um, it could be at the provincial or district, and even at the local level, to um, build their capacity to be able to analyze the health systems within their context and apply some of these methodologies. And, uh, and actually this whole webinar series has been inspired by some of the work that we have done. And uh, specifically last year to, to just to be very precise during the health systems research conference, when uh, we presented some of this work, there was a lot of interest from health professionals wanting to know a bit more about uh, these methodologies, they thought they were interesting, but then the question is like, how do we actually use them? How do we apply them? Because some of them are quite technical in terms of how you can use them and maybe they're time consuming and all those questions. So we thought this would be a great opportunity to come back and be in a closer range with uh, health professionals, like present those methodologies with the aim that uh, if, um, uh, someone is interested, they would like to use this methodology, they should be able to come back to us and then we can assist them in the, you know, how they want to apply it within their context. And for that matter, we today we are just going to present like a general overview of the various methodologies that are out there. And thanks to my colleague Gina, who has been doing a lot of work around this. Uh, through a project that she will explain to you a little more when she starts her presentation, where she was able to have a lot of these. And then every month we are planning to have a webinar series where we're going to look at a specific methodology uh, using a specific case study where so that people can understand better like how exactly can one can use 
uh, some of those methodologies or tools. For this year, we have planned three of them. The uh, first one will be next month, um, which I will be presenting. It's around group model building approach as a methodology. And uh, in there, there will be tools like uh, the causal loop diagrams, as well as rich pictures that one can use in understanding or analyzing the health system within their context. And uh, the month of November, we are going to have our colleagues also from UWC who will be presenting something on social network analysis, as you may have seen, maybe some of you have already registered. And then uh, we're hoping to continue with this series beginning next sometime in next year, because December we realized most people go for holidays and we thought we should not um, organize any such of those webinars. So in, um, in a nutshell, I would say that's the kind of background to this uh, webinar series. And we hope that um, we are all going to participate and feel free to write in the chat if you have any questions as uh, my colleague will be presenting or you can raise a hand and then at the end of the day, we are also going to have uh, a little bit of an uh, um, evaluation just to check what people feel about this webinar series. So in a nutshell, that's that. Um, maybe just to ask, does anyone want us to record the session? I know we have these copy rules where you can't just you know, record. So uh, unless people are, are interested to come back and listen to the presentation, then we can um, record it, but that will be based on people's consent. So if you want us to record, you can indicate in the chat. If not, then we, we will not record it. If we could have some indications on the in the chat. Thank you. I see some have indicated. And if for if it's for some various reasons, other people feel like they would not like to you know, have the recording. Yet. All right. Thank you. I see quite a number of people indicating in the chat that they would like to record. So I will. Okay, we will then do the recording. Thank you. So at this point in time, so that I don't waste much of your time, I will request my colleague Gina to take over uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Gina, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I, I'm using my phone because I don't have uh, to the internet. These are all third world problems, but we have to get by. So I'm using my phone. I hope you can see me. I'll just show a video of me briefly, and then I'll just go off um, just to save on bandwidth and the quality of my presentation. I hope that is OK with everybody. And I don't know if I can see myself, so I hope you can see me briefly. Trying to wave at you. <laughs> So yeah, um, so I'm going to my I'll, I'll try and introduce myself briefly and then take us through um, what actually stimulated uh, myself and Martina agreeing to pursue with this line of conversation beyond you know the uh, winter school which I used to also facilitate on um, when it was running uh, face to face. So but then there, there had been a lot that had gone on later on with a WHO project that we realized that look through the needs assessment, these kind of tools, people hear about them, but they are not too comfortable or the the environment do not allow them to put them in, into practice. So before I go into it, I'll just introduce myself. You know my name now. My name is Gina Teddy. Please feel free to refer to me just as Gina. Um, and please, if you can hear me, 
Um, let me know so I can do something about it. Um, I'm, I'm sitting at the moment at what we call, in, I'm sitting in Ghana, Accra, the capital, and I work with, as a lecturer with the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. Um, I've, I'm so much interested and in love with health systems that I, I founded uh, for GIMPA, a center for health systems and policy research, in short called CHESPO. And so we've been uh, promoting and training um, health systems um, issues with managers and the likes. So this webinar series is going to be just one of those um, things that I love doing, which is, you know, empowering people. Um, I'm sure that this will be, um, those online now will be a, bank, uh, a mix of different um, backgrounds, some being policymakers, others being frontline workers, implementers, and then also maybe um, researchers, academics, or um, uh, PhD or even MPH students. So I'm sure there will be a mix. And that is the beauty about these webinars because you tend to learn from each other and then you learn from the people's different experience and application of some of these things. So I really, really just want to encourage you that this um, particular type of webinars is such that more engagement actually bring the best out of it. So the more you ask questions, the more you engage, the more information we can share with each other. And so I will encourage there will be a session towards the end just to save on my battery before I probably lose that one as well. And there'll be a, an opportunity for us to engage in a, a group discussion um, and also, if you have questions, please put it down. I'll go to the chat every now and then to look at it. So if, if there is any question, I can take them quickly before we move on. Otherwise, um, I'll move on straight on. Martina, is there any question in the, in the chat box? Not, not that I can see, and I can just share. Let me see, there are some few. No. Okay, all right. Okay, so I guess the topic for today is um, introduction to complex health systems, using systems thinking tools to analyze complex health system. So basically it sounds like a mouthful, but what we are basically trying to do is to introduce you to basic tools around that we can use in terms of the work that we do routinely or in terms of decision making and our practices as people who work within the health sector. So there are a lot of tools that help you to be much more thorough, to be systematic. And these are called systems, uh, health systems thinking tools or simply systems thinking tools because some of them are not peculiar to health, but they are broader tools that have been adopted in health, public health and, and health systems specifically to help uh, managers, practitioners, implementers, and researchers to be able to analyze situations and actually be able to appreciate the depth of issues that they are faced with um, in terms of when they have to make decisions or when they have to um, put any um, interventions into practice. So that is what we are going to do. Um, and we are going to, I'll tell you the background of why we thought this was going to be useful. So Martina, if you can go to the next slide, please. So there is, um, we did um, a project with the WHO called SISTAC. SISTAC is, is, is an abbreviation for um, Systems Thinking Accelerator. And so we did a needs assessment across um, all the WHO, re uh, world, uh, WHO regions. So Africa was the one leading the African region. And so we did this uh, needs assessment to find out whether what people's understanding of systems thinking is. And as Yanda, if you don't mind, if you can launch the poll for them to uh, work with, that would be helpful. Um, so we asked people, or what the understanding of systems thinking. I'm sure now it is a buzzword. I mean, health system systems thinking is a buzzword. Um, if you have the poll, please kindly go through it um, and answer the questions for us because we want to know what your understanding is, whether you have any knowledge. If you don't have, there'll be an opportunity to discuss this and all that. 
And then we did this across various levels, particularly targeting uh, um, police uh, practitioners. And when we did this, we realized that there was a big gap in terms of capacity. Generally, people have heard about health systems. People know what systems thinking is about because it's you know spoken in policy words and now is becoming the buzzword. But the actual application of it, there is a huge gap between the knowledge that people have not, and even there is a gap in terms of the depth of the knowledge that people have. So then the question was, what could we do about it? And we just finished that um, NEAT assessment about three months ago. So the next phase is to try and, and, and um, harness our networks, which is like for me, uh, the UWC is one of my networks, and then other networks across different uh, countries in Africa to help them to support practitioners, policymakers, and the likes to be able to build their capacities around uh, systems thinking tools and then the application, the actual application of it. So then the, we realized that there was this need for capacity building, particularly for uh, health workforce and practitioners. The finding, next slide please, the findings particularly is that we had various tools and most practitioners were aware of these tools. Um, they have heard about them. They have seen them in some of their reports. Martina, can you move to the next slide? They've seen them in some of their reports. Um, they've used them as, um, they, they understand that they are system thinking tools, but they have not applied them at all. Some of them find them quite useful in terms of documents that they've read, um, some of them are actually applying these systems thinking tools, but they don't even know they are systems thinking tools. They don't know the reason why they, they know they just have to do it and they've done it in the past and they are doing it, but they will not acknowledge the added value of using these tools. Then also practitioners were, some of them were unaware at all. It is only through the description of these tools that they became aware that, oh, actually we use this daily. We've been using this quite often. And they, meanwhile, they didn't know what it's called and they didn't even know that it was something that was you know, a tool that um, uh, goes through a systematic process to arrive at uh, whatever outcome there is for you to arrive at. There was also um, issues around um, the gap between what you are required to do and, and the time that you have to do it. And so most practitioners told us that even though some of these tools are there because majority of the people that they work with may not have the same understanding of system thinking tools, people are reluctant to use it or people are pressured to deliver. So even though they know the tool will provide a much more sustainable long-term results, they would rather go for a quick you know, um, um, a, a, a quick fix of finding, you know, arriving at the results, which is tends to be short term. So these were quite uh, uh, revealing um, um, feedback that we got in terms of the results of these needs assessment. Then there were also issues of, of contextual factors constraining, particularly in some organization, and most importantly, leadership where the leadership may, be, may not be aware of these things, it's difficult to, to carry them out or for them to appreciate and, and promote them across the uh, organization or the unit or department in which people work. So these were all very interesting. Uh, Martina, if you can go to the next slide for me. It were all very interesting. And then we thought, we realized that some things need to be done. And some of the recommendations that came up was that we need to have some form of uh, need, uh, awareness creation to empower people using systems thinking tools. So this is a very useful, um, and Martina was part of, just to, for you to know, Martina was part of the people who engage in the needs assessment. So this is one of the key things that we thought, oh, upon discussion, it will be a very useful thing to, to disseminate them across the various countries that um, to help health workers, health managers, uh, health decision makers and health researchers to be on the same platform. Interestingly, there was a gap between academics and uh, practitioners. Academics were people who knew the tools and were, were, were using them or had used them. 
unlike partitioners who were using them but didn't know what they are or didn't have an idea it existed at all. So there was a huge gap. And sometimes we need to complement these two to bridge that gap from evidence to practice. So it was very useful that we advocated, particularly for leaders to get back in into this and use the systems thinking tools, also to build capacity across levels. So it's not just at the leadership point, but also with frontline workers and also different um, levels of the health system. Then also we thought, well, it also it will help to create some form of mutual and networking platform for people and leaders to support each other. So hopefully those of you on this webinar will be able to support each other moving forward. You may be sitting at different provinces or even different countries, but then if because you are all on the same platform or you have the same background, which will be seen now, you realize that supporting each other that can be rather helpful than you know going and reading everything all over by yourself, which can be daunting because there are so many things that is out there. Then yet again, we, we don't have any pro, uh, funding for this per se, but we are trying to do this to promote and have people who will be interested to champion the promotion of, of, of systems thinking in their workplaces and probably across the areas in which they work. So let um, um, Zianda have everybody else um, fill the poll. If they have, can we see the the um, results? Um, let me just see if I can check. Can you see the results, Gina? So it wasn't everyone. Um, okay. Okay, so we can go through the results. Um, I can only see question one, what is our systems? Is it just one person who took the poll? <laughs> can I encourage you all to take the poll? Uh, we just want to know your understanding of it. There are uh, options and if you think you want to add to it, that's fine. But there are so many different options. We would encourage you to, to do that and uh, apply, uh, try and give us your understanding of systems thinking. So one of the key things that we wanted to do is to understand what systems thinking is, because these are the tools that we want to use. And I think probably I would open the floor for people, we don't need a, um, a dictionary or a, a textbook definition, just your understanding, basic understanding of it. When you hear systems thinking, what do you understand by it? So I'll take one or two feedbacks and then we can come back to the presentation just so that we can save on time. Could we, if you have any, if you want to share your understanding of it, can you please raise your hand so that um, we, we get your feedback? In anyone who is bold enough to share with us. <laughs> you don't have to be bold. I mean, come on. It's a learning process. There's no right or wrong answer. It's simply your understanding of it. So um, could we get your understanding? So I'm on the next slide, please. Martin, I'm on the next slide. OK. You move to the next slide. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so do anyone want to share with us the understanding of systems thinking? When somebody says systems thinking, what comes to your mind? Okay, I guess not. Um, so there are so many different things. Oh, okay. Okay, so somebody thinks is, is the building blocks, the WHO building blocks. So that's fair enough. Um, any other thing?
whole. So seeing different elements as part of a greater whole. So this is basically what it is. Is is when we talk about systems thinking, it's going beyond the obvious and actually understanding the complexity, the interrelationship between various parts of the whole and how these parts lead to an outcome. Sometimes outcome that you can predict and sometimes outcome that you cannot predict. But it's looking at it from that holistic perspective in a systematic way where you are not necessarily um, looking at just one aspect without necessarily considering the other one, but you are looking at it from a systematic way of arriving at that um, what you call decision making. So I'm getting some more feedback saying there is an understanding of how similarly unrelated parts of a system influence the whole system operation, which is absolutely right. Um, and then also holistic approach to analysis of complex problem. The problem might seem very simple, but as you do a systems uh, approach, to solving this problem or unpacking this problem, you rather know that it is more of a complex problem than it appears to be. So systems thinking is actually telling us that, look, for us to have a sustainable health system, which we are all uh, uh, trying to achieve through the SDGs, we need to think about um, how we can do these things systematically, not just short term fixes that we tend to do because of the pressures and then the constraining environment that as health workers we work in, but we need to systematically do some of these things and there are tools out there that help us to achieve that. Okay, and by achieving that you need really need to to do these things in a way that will help you to know the outcome. And even though you may have some unintended outcomes, it's still part of understanding this is the way of the health system. So um, some of the tools, I think the next question, which is there is whether you have used any of these tools. And there are quite a few tools available for you to take out from. Um, Zianda, can you share that as well, if you don't mind? You want me to share the results to the second question, Gina? Yeah, yes, please. Okay. So I'm as not you sure can see, you... yeah, I can. Okay, this is I can. Ooh, okay. Okay, so we have different people with different knowledge. Um, so Costa Loop, nobody have used it yet. Um, I hope you can all see the results. Uh, soft systems methodology, um, very few, okay. So the most common one is mind mapping, concept mapping, reflective practice. No, um, not so much reflective practice, but social networking and outcome mapping. Then going down, we also have system dynamic modeling, fishbone. I think those are the common ones that we use, but the most popular one here is SWOT, SWOT analysis. And nobody has also used video or documentary diaries, but it's almost the similar to reflective practice. So, and then also quality improvements. So we have a bit of that as well. So there is a wide range, but the most common one I think is SWOT analysis, concept mapping and mind mapping. Okay, so we've seen the range of tools that are available. Um, we sometimes uh, use some of them because they are the easiest way of you know, doing things and they are part of the way of doing things in, and we are taught in management school that this is what you should do. So this has become, and one of the biggest one is particularly the SWOT analysis. This is a management tool. Those are tools that help us to, uh, as a manager or um, a leader or a supervisor, anybody in leadership position or management position, will have to try and use it to, uh, to prepare their own uh, documents. So you quickly, have to do this SWOT analysis before. And it's not surprising that most people have used it. But as you can see here, these are complex processes that um, I have listed, the process mapping, the outcome mapping, um, mind mapping. Um, this is also, these three uh, have been used by quite a few, 33% of those who took it. 
um, reflective practice, soft systems, we'll look at some of these things, uh, dynamic systems modeling or group uh, dynamic systems modeling, uh, social networking analysis, costal loop diagrams is under some of them, iceberg model and the rich pictures or diagrams. So these are all different things that, that we, we are available for us to use. Now, what I want you to think about all these tools is that there should be something like a tool in your toolbox. Martina, if you can move to the next slide. These are, should be think, thought of as two, uh, uh, tools in our toolbox. You know, um, most people have toolboxes at home or even in your kitchen cabinet, you have all sorts of things in your kitchen cabinet. So you go in, if you need a spoon, a knife, a fork, teaspoon, whatever, you go in. And so you are going to use the ones that are appropriate to the issues that you need to address. So it's not going to be just one item for all, but some will be more appropriate to some of activities or analysis or intervention than others, which is why we are introducing you to all of them. So this is just an overview to all of these things so that you have them as part of your toolbox as a manager or health, uh, health practitioner or health researcher. So that when you are dealing with health systems issues or even in decision making, you really will go in and look in your toolbox and say, which one will be more applicable and give me the best results that I want. And then you use it appropriately. So um, that's why um, we have it here, the next slide that they, are, they, they have different uses and formats. You will see that some of them are looking at a broader perspective, a system-wide perspective. And they help you to get this system-wide wide perspective. What I want you to do, to do is that once we start unpacking each of these ones that we've listed here, we'll not do everything. Those that are common will not do them because they are so common. Uh, but once we start unpacking them, you realize that there are so many things that we can do with them. Um, the first, and then some also help us to understand specific interventions. Others help us to understand specific issue. So it's looking at a particular issue. Maybe you are having issues, uh, uh, lateness with your staff um, and, or absenteeism. You can have a tool that can help you address that as compared to the issue of reaching out to your stakeholders or implementing a new policy that you need to understand who are the key stakeholders, what role can they play, what power and how can they influence my policy. So these are all various tools that address different things. Some of them are designed to improve service and patient's care. Others are designed broadly to look after the entire um, uh, sector. Um, also, some of them are man uh, help to address management processes, and some of them are more activity-based or service-based. So you have all of these different tools that help you to achieve these things. Now, so the ones that we are going to go through very quickly now is the ones that have been shown here, which is the process mapping, uh, SNA, outcome mapping, causal loop, mind mapping, and stakeholder mapping. So to start with, we'll look at the process mapping. Can we see by hand people who have actually used process mapping? And probably by the time we go through it, I'm not going to go through detail because this will be taking uh, month on month, a couple or one will be taken and then people who have used it for key projects will come and speak to it. Um, and so you get more training on the how to use it and, 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 and so on and so forth. But this is just to introduce you to all these different tools available. And then you yourself can decide which one you are interested in and which one you find you have gaps in, uh, need capacity building, then you can join any of the uh, webinars moving forward. But the process mapping, if you can see by hand, just um, click, raise your hand if you have used it before. And this is a tool which allow you to map out an activity or a service. So for instance, if you want to understand the process that your patients go through, outpatients go through, for instance, from when they arrive at the entrance of your facility to when they leave the facility, this is where you map out all the processes. Um, I hope you can see um, the slides. So it helps you to develop a map, a fiscal map. And sometimes it's very useful 
when you have this for in, in certain aspects in your facility. Some people in some facilities where they have had issues with people going through the process, they actually do a process map and paste it on in certain critical areas, especially the reception, so that they know how to refer people, especially if it's a big facility. If the person comes in, uh, where do you direct them? And sometimes they are mapped out all over the facility. But it helps you to know that when the person enters, this is the input, the starting point, what process would they, what is the first step, the next step? If they have, they don't have any next step, where should they go after that? If they have the next step, what are the decision points that they have to uh, go for decision to be made before they are moved to another point? So in, in my context where I'm, I'm sitting now, which is in Accra, Ghana, um, in most facilities, you, when you go, you have to report, and then you are directed immediately to the records, where you have to go and retrieve your records. Okay, if you had gone with your records, you still have to go and report that you are coming um, to the facility and you have to keep record that you are coming before you can even go to the next step. So that is your first decision point. And then they will direct you to whether you are going to see a nurse next or you are going straight to wherever. So it, it, whether it's a referral or whatever, what have you, they will actually make that decision. So that is your first decision point, okay? But your first uh, step is to talk to the receptionist mostly who will direct you to go to wherever you are going to, unless you are familiar with the place. So then of course, if you need the next step, the decision will be, will be there. And then where there are areas where people have to wait, you have to indicate it. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it gives you a clear understanding of where, what the starting point is, what the end point is, where the uh, steps are or what steps is involved. By mapping this, you are able to understand also whether you have too long a process and whether you should compress some of these uh, steps or whether you have such short uh, steps you need to improve or add on. So it's a very useful uh, a pictorial way of understanding um, a service that you are providing or the experience that your patients or activity goes through. And then it helps you to identify key decision-making points. And in that way, it also helps you to know where the constraining and bottlenecks are, where there are delays, and where you are repeating. If you have to do this, go here, go back, it will tell you all of these because you are mapping them out. So you need to do a thorough work in terms of actually mapping these things to understand what the issues are. And then it also increases communication and provide processes that you can document to understand which area the problems are to identify them. Okay, so that's the good thing about process mapping. And it's a very useful one to look out for and then to use if you haven't done them already. Now, when it comes to the next one we are going to look at is the outcome mapping. And I'll be rushing you a little because of time. The outcome mapping is also looking at, most of the time we are trained in business school um, to, look at things from processes, from one step, you know, we move to the next, to the next, to the next. But when you do systems, health systems or systems thinking, you realize that most of the time things do not pan out that way. And so it's not always input, output, outcome, and then input, activity, output, outcome. It's not always that case. So the outcome mapping sometimes, but since we are trained to do that, that's how some people prefer to work. They'll rather do that to be able to understand. And this is, if that is your style, then this is one of the ways that you can be able to unpack at each level what is going in, what are the activities that are coming out, what kind of output are you uh, going to expect or have, and then the long term outcome. The outcome mapping here is going to focus purely on outcome. And then you are going to map out and unpack the various outcomes, the possible scenarios that will play out, including even things you have intended or not intended. And then when you map that out, the essence is to understand how you can assess the project, 
how you can see tangible changes happening, especially if uh, the, the project or the intervention is going to anneal to some behavioral changes. So it's very useful to think about it and it helps you to map out. And as you can see in the, um, um, the diagram on your, or the figure in, on the right side of your screen, you realize that it has unpacked more of these and it will keep unpacking the, the outcome. Sometimes you have several outcomes and then you can still unpack those outcomes to get to the bottom of what you want to get before you get to the um, impact of the project. So it's also equally a very useful way of understanding the policy influence of your, your intervention your policies, your research, and so on. You can use it both for research and for practice. And it's a very useful tool, especially for uh, managers who wants to demonstrate what they are doing to uh, their um, um, staff and also to their immediate bosses or to region or province or the districts. So it's, it's also very good to, to use for planning, for monitoring and evaluation. And in that, before you even go out to do your, your to implement your policies or whatever intervention you have, you know clearly what the expected outcomes are. But it doesn't mean you should stick to it, it should be also flexible enough to accommodate uh, new outcomes that you have not intended, but it helps you to unpack these things to actually foresee some of these changes before they even happen. And yet again, you can use them as indicators for your monitoring and evaluation, which is a very useful tool to have. So I'm going to move to the next one, which is um, the why we should do them. It helps us to learn about influencing and progress of our project, like I said, you will be able to know the outcome and how this outcome, outcome can be unpacked to, into long-term impact and so on. And then you can also think about the behavioral changes that is happening. Um, in, and then also the changes in terms of boundary, which groups individuals are involved, how is this impacting on the organization overall, and then the contribution of these outcomes for the intervention that you are looking at. So I'm moving next to social networking analysis. This one is more of an individual understanding the various people involved in um, a particular project. Uh, Martina, if you can move. Okay, thank you. So the social um, networking analysis is basically allowing you to map out and measure the relationship and the flow of interaction or activities relationship between the various people involved. And this is very good if you have a policy uh, or an intervention that requires you to disseminate information. In that you, it helps you to know who, which different groups of people and what they are good at. The people who are likely to create conflict, the people who are most connected to the larger groups of people, the people who are more of brokers, they can uh, uh, mediate between the various groups of people. The people who are known as creating contagion, uh, they will share this information without even you saying it or asking them to. So you have different groups of people and how they play out within um, our, our uh, context. And I'm talking about work contexts. And if you look at the, the with the ongoing COVID-19, um, the uh, uh, contact tracing, they, had, they use basically the social networking analysis in that you look at who had reported, who have you been in contact with? And there are certain people, as soon as they mention them, you know you have a big issue to contact with small people and others you realize that it, it really doesn't matter. So all of these things tells you what the connections are. And I think there will be more, um, uh, there'll, I think that's the next two, um, webinar, which details will be given about it. But there are uh, computer models that helps you to do this. Um, it's actually a good way of understanding the flow of people, especially if you are dealing with something like public health uh, and, and communication um, interventions. They are very, very useful for you to do that. 
um, and also to understand how to engage people, who to engage. You may have the power, but you may realize that you may not reach out to more extensive people, and there are some connectors who may be able to help you to achieve that. So it's very useful to help you to understand the, the structure of the network that you have and how to engage and the behavior of the participant in relation to who is doing this. Then also the COSA loop diagram, which Martina is going to speak to next month um, as part of the group uh, dynamic models that she will be discussing. Here, it is, uh, this is more of a system-wide approach. And as we go, if, if we should go back, you realize that outcome mapping is also almost like a system-wide, but more of an intervention approach to, uh, or a tool that addresses interventions as compared to uh, process mapping that is focusing on service. Corsa loop diagram is more of a system-wide approach where you are actually uh, trying to understand a particular uh, phenomenon or health issue by trying to map out the various things that happens, whether they, they enable or facilitate or constrain the process whether uh, and the various ways that they influence, whether it is a negative influence, a positive influence, and so on and so forth. So you see the direction, and it helps you to understand things that happens in the context of issues that you have not even thought of. They are used to conceptually model these uh, various aspects or the different parts of, of an, a simple issue that you may be thinking of, but they are even more complex. And they also help you to understand the various factors, the processes involved, who is influencing what and who, and what direction they are influencing. And then it helps you to also understand the feedback. It gives you feedback, whether it's a positive feedback, negative feedback. It also help you to know whether it is a constraining or enabling feedback. And then you see the various levels that they are connected. It's very useful in identifying um, intervention points and issues that you should focus on and where your areas are that you should be thinking of. I think Martina will probably speak to this later on if she's got something to add to it, but then full training will be given on it and how she has used it. She's used it to do a whole range of um, um, resilience work. So she will, she will be giving more talk on this one. But the good thing is that it helps you to see clearly what direction, and there are so many tools out there that helps you to build this course loop diagram. So far as you can list out all your uh, factors that may be influencing in the direction in which they are, and then you can also do these things at groups, not individuals, because it makes sense to build this knowledge and make sense of them. That's why it's a system thinking approach. It's, it's more useful when you do them as a team than when you only do them as an individual. The next one is mind mapping. Next, please, Martina. The mind mapping uh, tool uh, is also one that most of us have used in the past. Um, and it's very easy to learn this if you've done any health a training, a management training as well, because here you are reflecting or, or you are thinking of how you are, um, the various factors that influence the issue and the processes, the, the, the cost of that um, activity that you are looking at. So if you, it tells you to look at it from various angles. And then it also helps you to improve and most people use this for patient care and quality of life of their patients. And sometimes people also use it for uh, mapping our staff and how staff engage. So it's, it's, it helps you to reduce overwhelming information into pictorial things that you have to address or to understand. And it's also very useful to do this as a team so people can understand where there are um, places where they can improve what are the red flags, what are the uh, key areas where they can support, what are the uh, constraining aspects that you can think of. But it mostly acts as a guide of, for reference and it's useful for advocacy work as well. Uh, it's a very helpful resource, especially for practitioners. So this is something that you can look out for yet again in, in maybe next year, we would be having some more of these training 
And I'm, I'm hoping that mind mapping will be one of them. Maybe all the mapping tools will be one of them. Then the stakeholder analysis or stakeholder mapping. That is one also that most people tend to um, overlook, but it's a very useful tool. Um, in that every intervention, whether small or large, in fact, even some basic interventions such as instead of having monthly meetings or having face-to-face uh, -face meetings, we are going to have online meetings. You really need to think about what kind of um, people you are going to engage with, which, is, uh, which are your stakeholders, what kind of uh, power people have to influence it, and what are their interests and what are their whether they are likely to support it, whether they are likely to go against it. All of these things are useful um, issues that you need to look out for. There are various uh, different kinds of stakeholder mapping tools. We have the first field map that tells you the power and interest map. So you look at the various power and interest, which is something that most policy and academics use. We also have the power uh, interest matrix, which is the first field map equally, um, but it's a much more complex one, looking at the level of uh, support as well as the level of power that people bring on board. We also have the salient model, and that one is actually looking at the power, legitimacy, and urgency. So this is also like more of more or less the uh, Venn diagram in the corner, um, con bottom corner, which shows you how this is used. And then also the stakeholder attitude and knowledge gap, a map. This is also the one on the top, telling you uh, on one side is the knowledge of the stakeholders, on the other side is the attitude of the stakeholders. And so all of these things, you want, also want to have the stakeholder influence and interest map. So we have so many different things, and these are useful techniques to understand who your stakeholders are, whom, and we need to bear in mind the fact that these people are stakeholders does not mean they have influence or they are useful to us, depending on the intervention. You must, you must think about the stakeholder depending on the intervention. And this is very useful in that sometimes you may have some powerful stakeholders, but for that particular intervention, they may not be helpful. So you need to look at who wields the power, who controls the resources you require, and so on and so forth, and how would they influence the project or the intervention that you are implementing. So it's very, very useful. And please put your questions down on the chat, we'll address them. It's very useful to think about all of these issues, but then you miss out unless you are systematically doing this. And these stakeholder mapping tools are there to help you to do them and to thoroughly understand which parties Sometimes you see that some people are interested, but they are not helpful to you. They'll rather create uh, more of uh, um, barriers to you than they will enable the process. So then those people, you work out strategies that you can use to you know, keep them at bay or keep them in, in an area where they may not necessarily impact so much on your intervention. So you really need to think of stakeholder as one of the key tools that are very useful to us. So I'm going to move to the next one, which is um, rich pictures. Rich pictures is also like a mind mapping, where but this one, you get teams or groups to come together to explore the knowledge of a situation or a particular activity or service. They have to simply map it out. You can do it manually with paper, pen, whatever you have, or you can do it using a software which is easily available online. Some of them are free, some of them you have to pay something small for them. But it's up to you completely to do this. But what I find with rich pictures is that it helps to define sense making. Sometimes you want to introduce a particular intervention, but people's understanding of that intervention is completely different. When you create, especially in, when you are doing this in a, uh, in a hospital-wide intervention or a district-wide intervention, you can actually help people to make sense of the process by engaging or defining some form of rich pictures. So if you are a facility manager 
or um, a department head or unit head, and you have different groups under you, you are able to do this when you get the different groups to actually make sense of what is happening once you have explained it to them. And then that is where you use it to correct some of the misconceptions that they may have or to understand how where they are coming from, where they stand, to be able to, to, to get them to understand it the way it should be or how you want them to do it. It doesn't mean you get everybody perfectly, but at least you understand their mindset and what they are bringing on board based on the image that they present as a group or maybe individually. The iceberg model is one of the soft models that we have here. It helps us to understand that it's, it's, it's basically a problem um, identification tool. And as you can see, the iceberg, uh, the problem that we are seeing physically is basically the tip of the iceberg. The major problem is at the bottom. And if you can see the right corner of the iceberg model, you realize that um, the tip which you see, oh, this is a big barrier that we have to cross. It's only just uh, the tip of the iceberg, literally. But the major thing is, is underneath. And that is what the issues within the health systems is. Because we work within a complex setting, a setting that is ever changing, it is ever evolving. It depends on so many relationships, making sense of new things all the time. Most of the time, if you don't take care to unpack the issues, you don't take care to identify what the contributing factors are, what the determinants of uh, socioeconomic determinants and other determinants of the issues are. You are likely to miss out on the problem, the cause of the problem itself. And the iceberg to help us to unpack, understand and identify some of these problems, social and behavioral problems that may be influencing the problem that we see as a technical problem. So it's also a useful tool to have, um, and it's, you can use it as a, a system-wide approach or an intervention approach, but it basically helps you to unpack your issues um, and the problem that you are facing as a manager or a unit head or even a, a practitioner sitting in a place where you are having an issue. Reflective practice, I'm not going to spend so much time on it because we all do them without even knowing. It's simply the opportunity to think through what you have done, study it again, and actually see whether you, you've achieved what you are going to achieve, whether you could have done things the other way around, whether you can improve on what you have done, um, whether there are lessons to learn from what you have achieved, and so on and so forth. So it's basically sitting and reflecting on something that had happened. The good thing about reflective practice is not to do it for the sake of doing it, but to do it and learn lessons from it. As professionals, even in our own private life, sometimes we take decisions and we are not too sure whether it's the right one. But once decisions are taken and they've been acted upon, it helps when you reflect and see whether we could do the same thing again and whether we could do it better, whether we could avoid it, whether we could, you know, tweak it or whatever it is. So then it helps you to think about it, but there are different levels of reflections. If you are reflecting on something to describe, how do I describe things to people to understand? Then you are asking about the what. So what could have been done? What is the issue? What, these are the what questions. And if you want to look, look at the outcome or the theoretical aspect of it, the knowledge building aspect of it. So what, we've done this, so what? What are we going to get out of it? What are the lessons we can live? So the so what questions are the ones that help you to reflect on. And then also the action-oriented reflection. Now what, we put this into action. Um, are people responding now? What should we do next? What is, you know, so you need to look at the what in different uh, aspect. And so it helps you to reflect. It's a very useful thing. I know nursing training mostly helps people to do that. They have reflective diaries that they normally use um, to see whether they have done things correctly or not and what they can improve. And if you are training or even in practice, some of them still keep using it. But um, sometimes because we are managers and we are overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day routine issues, we tend to forget the usefulness of some of these reflective practices. It's a very, very useful tool. 
Some environment enable them, others don't. If you are a manager, a leader, even as a researcher, you need to be able to understand that reflective practice, create room, use some part of your meeting for people to reflect. We introduce this thing. Could we reflect on what, what, the, what the what issues, what if, what uh, now what issues? So what issues? Then you can create spaces to have a useful meetings rather than the routine. Okay, this this check check check. People come and there isn't much to achieve. It's it's a very uh, useful thing to have and a good management tool. So you can see there are various theories that can be applied. These are examples of it. Martina, next slide, please. You have the gift reflective cycle. You have the uh, donation concept of reflective practice. All of these are various uh, examples of the various reflective practices. But you find what you are comfortable with. Not only do we use it in health, but they use it also in education. Find whichever one. You can use a basic one yourself and ask the critical questions that you think are important to you, the practice, the intervention, and whatever outcomes you hope to achieve. So yet again, very, very useful. We have the dynamic model um, so that we can have time in the end. I'm rushing you a bit, but we are not far off. We have the dynamic model. Um, this is more or less like the COSA loops. It's also looking at various uh, factors, feedbacks, uh, flows, and it simply shows a complex dynamic system. What is more important is that, unlike the linear outcome mapping, which tells you once you put in A, B, and C uh, or inputs, you are likely to, uh, to into these interventions and activities, you are likely to get these outputs and outcomes. These dynamic models and complex models simply tell you that it is more complex than that. There might be mitigating factors, there might be other factors, relationship issues, behavioral issues, stock flow, resource issues, feedback loops that may change the direction altogether. So how do we capture these, these complexities? It is through some of these group uh, uh, dynamic models or uh, whatever models, complex models that we have. There are a range of them. This is by no means the, all the, the list of uh, tools that are out there, but these are the common and the most useful ones that most people tend to apply, uh, which we got from the um, needs assessment that we did. So moving on to some of the common, um, uh, most common tools that are applied, we do have the five Y's. These are all problem and education tools, decision tree or problem tree, same difference, uh, fishbone analysis or issue. Chikawa diagram, which looks at the various aspects of the unpacking the problem or identifying the problem. We have the SWOT analysis, which look at strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Um, and all of these are useful for us to unpack. Of course, we are managers to manage problems. So these are also useful tools for individuals, for team, for the whole organizations to come together to try and find solutions. Oh, sorry. It, and one thing I noticed in the course of using and teaching these is that the problem tools are equally decision-making uh, decision tools and they are solution tools. So if you take the five whys, for instance, it helps you to identify where you should focus in terms of the problem. And then it also helps you to know where you should find solutions or you should uh, actually um, um, address. So the same problem, and uh, identification tools can be used to identify uh, solutions. So they are also solution tools. They work as double-edged tools that you can actually apply. And they are very easy, very simple to apply. They can also be self-taught. And I'm sure most of you have done some management training would have been exposed to these things one way or the other. Quality improvement. Once you are um, somebody who work in the field, you probably would have been exposed to various quality tools, depending on where you sit. There are specific quality tools, which I didn't... Um, this here, two specific uh, is this ones here um, that we use broadly for service, I mean, across facilities. And these are the lean improvements. Uh, or the Six Sigma. This one is basically an efficiency improvement tool. We have the PDSA, which most of you are exposed to. 
and then communication tools um, of various kinds, clinical audits, parental charts, and, and control charts, which most of you are. Uh, yes. There seems to be some noise. I'm sure that's just me hearing that. Uh, I'm not sure. Does everybody hear like some noise background? Or is, is it okay with the others? I can hear it too, Martina. Okay, we are done. We are done. We are now going to go into the group discussions. We have fewer people now. Um, so we can get people. Um, I don't know if it will make sense to do this um, as um, a breakout session or we should simply just open the floor for people to engage with the, the various tools that they've seen um, and also if they have any questions around how this can be applicable to them on a day-to-day -day basis of their work and then also um, how they can, whether the environment will enable them to do this or whether there are challenges. So that's the, the next step that we are at. So yeah, um, I think the floor is open. Um, could we... Thanks so much, Gina. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are on that page, but I think looking at the time, we can just do it as a whole group because we won't have time. We only have about uh, 12 minutes left before the end of the session. So I propose that maybe we just have uh, people put into in the chat. So just to indicate, yeah, what they think about the workshop. Or what exactly do you do? Would they want to get from it? I know we have also at the end of the final evaluation form um, poll that people will have a chance to fill in, but maybe um, a bit of discussion around, but you are also free just to raise up your hand and maybe speak what you think of these tools that have been presented today and whether they speak to you in any way and uh, yeah, and how you think you will be able to apply them. And then the other question is that what do you, how, what do you think is, will be helpful for you in terms of participating in these workshops? What do you think would be the best ap approach of um, you know, organizing this? As you know, we will definitely be going through each one of the, the tools that have been highlighted, like in more details, but we are planning to, to use case studies. So where they have been used in a specific context, answering a specific issue. Um, yeah, so we, we're wondering whether you also have some idea of how best you think this could be relayed to you, how best you would love this. As we said, it's our first time presenting this and we really want to impart the knowledge to, to you all and how best can we do this. So you can raise up hands or you can just type in the chat, whichever you find um, much easier. Or you can just talk if you don't see the raising hand symbol, because I know in some cases people don't. Yes, I can see Lungile. You raise your hand. How are you? Hi. Yes, oh, thank you can go. Thank Hi. you so much for the webinar. It has been very helpful. Um, so I would personally love to know more about um, the causal loop diagram and the, 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 the dynamic model, they, they seemed a bit complex, but I'm really happy that, you know, in the next upcoming um, sessions, they will be covered more in details, um, also using applied case studies as well. Um, so we, we've also, um, you know, in, in, in where I, I work, we've sort of integrated some of the models. Like I know we've used the iceberg model and the stakeholder analysis 
in recently. Um, so now we are at a stage where we would really like to identify, um, you know, where to intervene, you know, having done the preliminary work of mapping out stakeholders and, uh, you know, identifying the problems through the iceberg model. So I, I, I really, I'd, I'd appreciate more um, on that, on, you know, knowing how exactly to identify like leverage points and, um, mm. and where to intervene um, post, you know, identifying the complex problems and inter interacting with the stakeholders and, um, mm. and so forth. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lungile. Um, if I may ask, from which organization are you from? The Rural Health Advocacy Project. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, definitely we'll be talking more about causal loop, causal loop diagrams in our next session, which will be next month. At Think the 20th of uh, October. So, yeah, if you will be there, that would be great. So, you can, Tim's Dynamics Modeling, if they, that's where we, you really want to, to focus on. The thing is that with the systems dynamic modeling, you need um, kind of data as, as um, uh, Gina presented. So, you have this, the stocks and flows. So, you need the, um, information information that you can you know plug in and so in my experience using this methodology so because i did case studies in in africa so it was one in um uh Cote and the nigerian here in south africa and in in all the three case studies we were not able to move on uh after creating the causal loop diagrams to then move on to the the dynamic modeling stage because the data wasn't just you know, available not. So not, not 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 that it's not necessarily there, but quality data because remember it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you try to model something with data that is not of good quality, then it doesn't doesn't just work out. So because of that, we kind of just uh, dropped that part of uh, the modeling. But we know, like in most of our you know these high income countries, usually they have very good data. So I'll say most of the modeling has been done on the, that part of the world. So trying to do it from our part of the world, it was just not that easy. And we thought rather we focus on identifying these um, uh, intervention points, as you have rightly said. So you have talked with the stakeholders, but you don't know where exactly to start from. So the causal loop diagram actually do quite a lot in terms of making you uh, come up with a decision on where do we start? Uh, where can we make these quick wins? So definitely, I think the causal loop diagrams will do. But depending on your needs, if you really want to move on to the systems dynamic modeling, we can try and do that. But I'm very excited to see that you are able to identify one specific um, tool or methodology that you would really want to. And this is what we are looking for to hear from um, most of you, at least more of you. So what would you like to get from you know, all that we have presented now so that we are more focused moving forward? Thank you. Any other comments? Um, okay, so I see, is it Mayor? You asking for articles, so like uh, some, yeah, we we'll definitely can send you some articles. So when we'll be presenting the different methodologies, I think we'll accompany that with a few references that then you can also read through and uh, yeah, then you can refer to them whenever you, you want to use the different tools. And it can also be need-based, as we're saying, we really also want to connect with you at a personal uh, basis. If you have a specific need and you want us to help 
So for example, you want a social network analysis of causal loop diagrams, then we can specifically link you to somebody who has actually applied and used the tool. They are very familiar with it. And then we can send you even personalized, personalized package of the material that you're looking for, depending on your need. We would not want just to flood people with everything that we have discussed in here, if that makes sense. Any other contributions? Yes, Longile. Um, so our November webinar will be on social network analysis and likely Fidel, uh, colleague Fidel Mutinda, Mukinda is right here. He will be presenting that and he has used that in his research. Um, I don't know, Fidel, if maybe you want to say something about that. Lungile is asking about um, if social network analysis has been used somewhere in research. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to find out, so post, um, is it something that can be used? Uh, so after maybe you have um, done the stakeholder analysis or the mapping of the stakeholders and maybe also engaged with the stakeholders also, is this, is this a tool that is to be used post that? And I'm asking if perhaps a research um, can be framed around that um, post, you know, the engagement and the analysis of the stakeholders to sort of, um, uh, yeah, see how the relationships are and to create that information. Okay, Fidel, are you still here? Um, she's she's talking about stakeholder analysis, I think. Or oh, is stakeholder So, hi. I thought you were talking about. Uh, uh, you say you have already done the stakeholder analysis. Can I can I take the question, Martina? Tumela here. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So the social network analysis does not need to be done after. You don't need to do the stakeholder analysis before to do the social network analysis. You can do them independently. You can do them together. So the social network analysis primarily looks at the relationships, um, the different relationships between the actors within a system. So it, it would be good to do a stakeholder analysis to identify who your stakeholders are and perhaps what influence they have. But your, your social network analysis will also show how much they connect amongst, um, amongst themselves. So they don't, they don't need to, you don't need, you can do them independently, you can do them together. You can do your, your, your social network analysis before because they will show you different um, influences. The stakeholder analysis will show you the influences of your stakeholders, but your social network analysis will show you the relationships between the, 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 the stakeholders or your actors. I don't know if that answers the question that was asked. Okay, no, thank you so much. I think the follow-up. Um, I think they are, it depends on what you want to achieve. Yeah. So if you want to understand that, okay, um, I have an intervention, I want to see who can influence this intervention and how would they influence it, then you need stakeholder analysis. But if you have um, an intervention where you have to reach out to more people and you want to know the relationship between the people and how can you reach out to them, maybe dissemination or community, then you, you, your, your best option will be social networking analysis because then you are or any facing the connection the network between people the social networking analysis is your uh, option so you can do the two things side by side depending on what you want to find out um but they, they, they address different questions so it, it, most of the tools are there to be, depending on what you want to do you can choose the tool that is more appropriate for it thank you Thank you. Um, does that kind of answer your question, Lungile? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I couldn't um, quite hear 
Um, okay. Last, All right. Yes, properly. But I, I, I did get you know the gist. Um, thank you very much. Um, and, and just so okay. sorry, shortly, I just want to ask if there are any papers available for reference or even research papers that have used this as a framework. Yes, definitely. Is this something that you want to urgently uh, work on now? Because definitely we are going to have a webinar on uh, social network analysis uh, in November, where mm -hmm. more details will be given and how exactly it was um, applied. And But if you want to already start working on around that, I think we can always um, Oh, sorry, I was actually cut off. Can you hear me? Yes, now, now you can. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, we're already over our time. I think we just have to conclude on this. And Zianda was wondering, we did have those questions um, um, that we wanted to ask people. Do you think we should still do this now or we, we should send it? Um, people via the emails, which we, the, we had on the registration. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, we can send them a link to an evaluation um, that we can probably do on Google Forms, because yeah, we are yeah. out of time. Yeah, yeah, I'm mindful of people's uh, time because people might have another event, you know, soon or joining another meeting. So yeah, just me to say thank you so much for attending this webinar series and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And please feel free to connect with us um, at any moment if you need specific information. For example, Lungile, if you want some information on, on, this, on any specific tools, we are happy to in, give you that information as well. And any one of you, uh, if you want further information on any of the, the stuff that we have presented to today, we are happy to assist in any form. But we look forward to meeting you in our next webinar series. And uh, yeah, thank you so much and uh, have a lovely day. Unless my colleague Gina has something else to say, I would... No, thank you all for joining and staying with us. It will be a late. <laughs> okay, yeah, and thank you, Gina, for the presentation, of course. It was great to hear all that work that you really worked hard through the syntax pro program. Thank you all. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. <laughs>